got it. A very good evening, my friends in Christ, and welcome to our final session in this series of baptism, the gateway to communion. As we wait for the others to come, I hope you had a wonderful week thus far. Um, we sing the hymn, only trust him, only trust him. again a very good evening and a warm greeting to all today in our West Indian province continuing all like now is the ordination and consecration of the 23rd bishop I think that's the numbers correct of the diocese of northeastern Caribbean and Aruba that is the bishop now Ernest Alroy Fleming. And so as we begin with our prayers, we will include him in our prayers. The Lord be with you. Let us bow our heads to pray. Loving and awesome God, we thank you for the day that is past and for this evening hour. We thank you, Lord, for how you continue to manifest yourself to us in the world. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will always be strengthened by your almighty power and that we may open up ourselves to be used by you. So Heavenly Father, by your baptism into the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, you turn us from the old life of sin. Grant that we, being reborn to new life in him, may be renewed in the spirit of our minds and live in righteousness and true holiness 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, the giver of all good things, in your divine providence, you have appointed various orders in your church. Give grace, we humbly pray, to all who are now called to the office and ministry for your people, especially Ernest Fleming to become the 23rd Bishop of the Northeastern Caribbean and Aruba. Heavenly Father, continue to fill him with your truth and your doctrine. Clothe him with holiness of life that he may faithfully continue to serve before you to the glory of your great name and in the benefit of your holy church. Bless his family. Lord, indeed, bless the entire diocese and may all their labor continue to be done to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Once again, my friends in Christ, a very good evening. Kofi, it's over to you to welcome those on the other side. All right, All right. so I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. A blessed good evening to everyone. I'm noticing that we are a little bit, uh, we have a few people missing on Zoom and I'm hoping that they will soon join us. But I am sure that they will definitely come in to Zoom as we uh, continue this evening. Uh, so far on YouTube, a blessed good evening to everybody over there in YouTube land. I'm seeing we have about 31 persons on YouTube. So Agatha Bess, a good evening to you. She's always here first. It's as if she's waiting for Bible study. So we are so glad to have you, Agatha. Jennifer Hines, good evening to you. Vilma Thomas, good evening to you as well. Patsy Price, uh, good evening to you. Margaret Farrell, so glad to have you with us. Victor Gittins, you're always here, always supportive. Glad to have you with us. Judy, uh, Phillips, good evening to you. Uh, Sister Barbara Phillip from St. Lucia, good to have you. Pam Walker, it's good to see you here as well. So we've now grown to 33 persons over there on YouTube, and I'm sure we'll keep growing throughout the evening. So to everybody on Zoom, everybody on YouTube, so glad to have you, and we look forward to a very interesting and exciting discussion over the next hour, hour and a half. Over to you. Thank Rev. you. Thank you so much. Now, last oh, week, Rev, we... I'm going to be missing for two seconds as I go to the car to get the computer charger. It's about today. No problem. Yes, please. So last week, we looked at Jesus being raised from the dead. And now this week, because our Lord is raised from the dead, we have the offer of new life. That's our topic. Jesus offers new life. We all know the experiences of Jesus having appeared to his disciples and to friends after the, his death. He appeared after the resurrection, after the third day. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit, and this Holy Spirit infused them so that they became witnesses witnesses of his saving embrace and because of jesus's death and resurrection we are offered new life that is the topic for this evening the apostle paul explains that this to us in romans 6 verses in romans 6 verses 3 to 4 that christians are intimately united with christ through their baptism as christ has died so also the Christian dies to sin. And that's where the immersion part comes in, you know, the actual going under the water symbolizes the burial, the actual burial. And that is how most of the persons were baptized in Jesus's day in, in that era. But as things, as Christianity began to spread and conversions happened, entire households became baptized as well okay 
So that whole symbolism of the being buried, that's where that's what Paul refers to, being buried with Christ. So Christ, as Christ has died, so also the Christian dies to sin. As Christ was raised from the dead and enjoys a new relationship with God, the Father, so also the Christian now has to share in this newness of life. So throughout the Easter season, we reflect on Jesus' resurrection and the walk through and a walk through the service of the Easter vigil on the Book of Common Prayer leads us again and again to the theme of his triumph over the grave. And you know, at the Easter vigil, we normally have Bible readings from Old Testament scripture, which speak to um, the beginning of creation, which speaks to the Exodus, God's deliverance of the nation of Israel from bondage in Egypt. Um, all the passage of water, all, all of this happens. We talk as well sometimes, we, we, we talk about Ezekiel's dry valley of bones, the valley of dry bones, the bo bones come into life and because new breath, breath has been breathed into them. So the whole Easter visual, the lighting of the new fire, all of that symbolizes the new birth, the new birth of Christians into the spiritual realm, so to speak. The colic for Easter day talks about grant us so to die daily to sin so that we may be alive evermore in him in the joy of his resurrection. So this session provides an opportunity for us to reflect now on the compelling imagery of death being overcome by eternal life and the essence of the Christian faith because basically that is what is Jesus' death and his rising is the essence of our Christian faith, being raised to new life. So that is where we are headed this evening and we have to complete the story. So three of you lined up yourselves so that you can um, continue this story, so that you can complete this story. And the question is continuing in sin. For their New Year resolution, Sam and Tony Ann decided that they were going to live new, changed lives. They wanted to remain chaste, give to the poor, and treat others with respect. Like many who make resolutions, they found it hard to keep them and have fallen into all sinful habits. However, they have come to seek advice from a trusted friend, and that is you. What would you tell them about continuing in the life of sin? They've come to you for advice, for guidance. What are you going to tell them? So we need three scenarios. Get all excited and Oh, motorcycle passing, so it's kind of noisy. Anyway, okay. No problem. Right. I, I, this is what I would say. I would say to them that, that life is dynamic and it's constantly changing. I think the first thing that they would probably need to do is to acknowledge that sin, that sin is a part of life. And the mere fact that they have acknowledged that their sin, to my mind, is the first step towards their salvation or redemption or however you want to put it. Now, the fact that Jesus died for our sins indicates to me that that sin is a part of life and that Jesus died for my sins, acknowledging that because I am an imperfect human being, that I'll be inclined to sin. But the whole idea behind that is that I am striving to, or that you are striving to improve upon yourself and even though you may sin, the sin, in, the sin in itself, to my mind, well, it all depends on what it is, may not necessarily be a bad thing in that, I guess we learn from our mistakes, we learn from our errors, and the fact that you have acknowledged that you have sinned, to my mind, that in itself shall help you to become a stronger person or a stronger individual. Um, I would probably suggest to them that maybe if they look at Simon Peter, Simon Peter was one of Jesus' most trusted disciples, but yet still Simon denied Jesus 
when Jesus probably would have needed him most. So I would say to them that they need to pray about it. Um, they should probably reflect upon their lives daily and at the end of every day or whatever, and try to see how you can improve upon your life the following day. Because life is ever constantly changing and there are times when even though you're striving to be better or to do better, you will fall back into your old ways. So recognize the fact that yes, you may have fallen, but get up. It's all about getting up and renewing yourselves. So that would be my advice to them or suggestions to them. Thank you, Winston. Yes, life is dynamic oh, and ever changing. And get up, yes. Very good. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Keith and Roslyn. You, you both of you coming to me for advice. <laughs> and, and this is coming to you for advice. <laughs> well, now these are my friends. And they have been trying for some time and pumped into themselves to live a Christian life. They, have made the resolutions and they find that they cannot, that they've been unable to keep them. First thing I would suggest to them to get married. First thing, because there's no way two single people, two healthy male and female single people living together is not going to commit fornication. They will. So the first thing, and the why I'm saying this is because you have to be aware of evil and try to shun it. You cannot, you cannot live the life that you are trying to live on your own strength. You must read the Bible, you must study it, and most importantly, this path you are about to take is a faith path. Faith. So you must have faith and at the same time reach to God for help. Shun evil. You can't play with evil and don't expect to, to fall into it. You're going to fail on your own. And there's no way. Because you were designed as a couple. Uh, but you were sending. So you're putting yourself in the path of carrying on, carrying on the old way of, of satisfying the flesh. That's not going to work. So to avoid Listen, that, now, let's take our location, but like, nothing can happen without the location. <laughs> that, good. Now, and then having tried to impress upon them, need to put themselves in a position to avoid sin, then I would try to impress upon them. For some reason, Keith, for some reason you're going up and down. I, I don't know why, just that right, I Right, that's better, that that's better. Oh, okay, I, 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 okay. Maybe yeah. I must say being away from the mic a bit. Uh huh. But uh, yes, I will try to impress upon them that they have to read the Bible and try and pray about it and pray. And with God's help, they can, they can succeed. But most of all, try to put, avoid sin. Try to avoid areas where you know you, you, your flesh will fail you. Look, Christ in human form came to earth. 
and he was tested and he was tested and the devil has a way of testing you especially if he's trying let me see what you're trying to get done so you must try your best to avoid certain situations which may lead to your death and that's it for me I like how you pick up on that thing. Why? Why you say that they get him? That they need to get married because they because say that there's they... no way that the two of them living together can remain chaste. Oh, they want to be chaste. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So how they keep thought they were living together? They said that. It says that. that. Oh, really? It says that. that. It suggests that it's implied. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. And the third person. What are you going to say to these two young people? I assume they're young as well. Uh, what are you going to say to them as they come to you? Because um, like many who make resolutions, it's, it's hard to keep the Commitments that we want. It's hard to keep the promises. One other person. What are you going to say to these people who are your friends? Well, I was um, I was more along the lines of Winston, where I was going to tell them that um, we we all fall short. We all sin. None of us are perfect. Perfect, but if we surround ourselves with people of like minded, like minded people who are trying to walk the walk, you know, somebody to support you, we, we will all fall, we will all make mistakes, we all have our down days, and sometimes we will be the supporter and sometimes we will be the supportee. But if we surround ourselves with people who of a, you know, as I said, a like mind, a, a faith community or somebody who will help you when you stumble and not berate you for stumbling, but help you along the path and say, that's okay, we all make mistakes, get up, let's go again. But, you know, you would, as Keith says, avoid, try to avoid temptation to the best that you can. And still, you know, acknowledge your humanity. <laughs> That's what I would say. Thank you very much. It's interesting. We all deal with different things. We, we deal with our situations differently. And everything is always in context. Okay? When Keith said that he was going to tell them to get married, I wondered if he was going to help pay the bill for his wedding too. <laughs> Keith, you and look up. <laughs> but yes, sometimes whenever we are counseling people or helping them, we need to help them to make the decision, make their decisions. But we have to be supportive of those persons, you know, who find themselves weak. Because as Hazel says, sometimes we are the, sometimes we are the supporter and sometimes we are the supportees, yes. Sometimes we need support and we need to help each other. It's so important. And remembering our frailty and even pointing to the biblical examples do help us to grow along the way. Um, and it is not easy, that is for sure. Living in this life is not easy because as, you, as we said last time, Peter and the others went back fishing. They went back to the old. It's easy to go back to things that are familiar, not necessarily sinful things, but because, you know, sometimes there are some good, healthy things that are sinful. So to eat is important, but gluttony is a sin. Overeating and doing everything in excess is sinful. Okay? So we really have to be cautious in our living our life living and always be connected to god and his holy spirit that prayer that's why the prayer life is important and being in the right company birds of a feather do flock together very important 
So now we are on to our Bible reading. This Bible reading is extremely long. It's 14 verses. So we have to really listen. And the passage says that we, the, the instruction says that we need to read it slowly. So because it is so long, yeah, it needs to be deliberately read. So we need two persons to read the first one up. So let's listen and make our notes as we hear the passage being read. Romans 6, 1 to 14. There is coffee. Okay. All right, so that means he is what you are reading. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Okay, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 14 from the New English Translation. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not present your members to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will have no mastery over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before a quiet time, let's hear those phrases, those sentences, those verses that jump out or, or you or those words. Three of them. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Okay. Oh, we, no, we would no longer be enslaved. We Let's would see. no longer be enslaved. Something like that, yeah. And finally... Anything else, someone? If, if you were united in his death, I think that was the phrase, if you were united in his death, you will also be reunited with him in, in his resurrection. Thank you. 
And now we pause for a moment, silence, reflection. All right, now we need the second passage, please. And a second reader. The New International Regions Version, Living a New Life in Christ. What should we say then? Should we keep on singing so that God's grace can increase? Not at all. As far as sin is concerned, we are dead. So how can we keep on singing? All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. Don't you know that we were baptized into his death? By being baptized, we were buried with Christ into his death. Christ has raised, has been raised from the dead by the Father's glory. And like Christ, we also can live a new life. By being baptized, we have been joined with him in a death like his. So we will certainly also be joined with him in a resurrection like his. We know that what we used to be was nailed to the cross with him. That happened so our bodies that were ruled by sin would lose their power. So we are no longer slaves of sin. That's because those who have died have been set free from sin. We died with Christ. So we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ was raised from the dead and will never die again. Death doesn't control him anymore. When he died, he died once and for all time. He did this to break the power of sin. Now that he lives, he lives in the power of God. In the same way, God considers yourself to be dead as far as sin is concerned. Now you believe in Christ Jesus. So consider yourselves to be alive as far as God is concerned. So don't let sin rule your body, which is going to die. Don't obey its evil desires. Don't give any part of yourself to serve sin. Don't let any part of yourself be used to do evil. Instead, give yourselves to God. You have been brought from death to life. So give every part of yourself to God to do what is right. Sin will no longer control you like a master. 
That's because the law does not rule you. God's grace has set you free. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we need our three responses. I see here, so you're out of the block first. Your hand is up. Yes, um, I actually wanted to do something. I just wanted to read this part from the message I read this morning. Um, mm. I just like this translation. He said, we know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again will death have the last word. When Jesus died, he took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. I like that. <laughs> that and which brings... verses are those? This, this is um, the message. Verses, verses, um, verses. Uh, verses. Oh, um, I'm not sure because my Bible goes from six. It has from six to 11. So maybe like seven, okay. eight. Yeah. Okay. This one, I could get yes. it on my phone. It would tell me exactly what it is. No but... problem. No yeah. problem. Yes. Okay. Yes. So now, now we need those words that come out to us. You see how these translations make sometimes life easier <laughs> or more understanding? Okay, let's hear. Gloria? All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. All of us. Oh. Okay. Next. Next person. What phrase, what verse strikes you? Oh, Vincent, go ahead. Okay. We know that what we used to be was nailed to the cross with him. Yeah, I like that too. We know what we used to be. And next, anybody else? Okay, I'm going to fill that slot then. I actually like the first verse. I, not that I like it. That's the one that hits me all the time. Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? The, the, the verses I read were 9 and 10. 9 and 10. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. We know that what we used to be is now nailed to the cross with him. Should we continue in sin? We pause for a moment. Right. Thank you so much. Now we have two questions to lead us into our reflection tonight. And this passage, of course, as I said to you, is quite lengthy. And because it's lengthy, I guess it's a lot that's going on, but there's still two questions. And because there are two questions, doesn't mean we have to go on long, but or that we have to go short, but we really have to 
try to attack these questions. I want to attack these questions so that we can really get the meat of it and not only get the meat so that we can continue to walk the straight and narrow. So, for, so the qu first question, do we choose our sin? Do we choose our sin? Reading from the life. Yes, go um, ahead. I know I choose some of mine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know you choose some of yours. <laughs> Because remember, I think I talked about this before, the foolish phone yeah. with these games. So oh, many dear. times I'm on this game and I said, you really, you, you know, you should be really spending some more time with God or doing something more worthwhile. I know it within myself that I should put down the foolish phone and start hurting my eyes and everything. But it's like a little mini addiction. You get addicted to these games. So I know I choose some of mine for sure. Mm. Uh, so what prevents us from, from so what present, prevents us from choosing salvation? What is it, that thing? What is it? Could you answer the yes? What is it? What is it? Paul just said, we have been buried with Christ. Um, we know what we used to be is now nailed to the cross. So if that is, if Paul is accurate, why, why, what prevents us from choosing this sin? And so Keith is gonna respond. <laughs> to me, yes, like Hazel, we choose our sin. It is always a, a decision we make, no matter what we have to make that decision to do whatever it is that we ought not to have been doing, we made that decision. But it is always easy to sin because the truth is sin, like a child, sin is pleasurable, is pleasure-centered. However, salvation is not. Yes, we should derive pleasure in salvation, but it is greater effort. Salvation calls for effort the kind of effort that you do not require to to do something sinful hmm. Hmm. yeah and it's it's it, it's easy it's something if it's something that you're familiar with they say it takes 21 days to develop a habit so if you get into the habit of doing this thing then it's harder even though you Know that what you're doing is wrong it takes the willpower it takes the grace of god it takes some serious prayers or whatever to, to break it but as you know as key says it it's 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 familiar and something like but for example like the game you can say but what's the real harm you know what i mean yes you should be spending time doing something else or maybe having a serious conversation or something like that but yeah well, I know mine is lack of willpower sometimes. Can I, say I believe, something? I believe um, Rev, that it is strength that you need every day. I like the first scenario, it is strength. It's not, it's not your willpower. Your willpower is easy. But you have to pray every day for God to give you the strength to say no. And as Keith said, it's so easy to say yes. And Yes, I agree that we choose our battle. We choose our sin. But it all boils down for me is the strength to say no. And you can only get this strength from, by praying and asking God to give you that strength to overcome. But hmm. if, we, if we sin by thought, word, and deed, okay? Mm -hmm. And we continue to do it, it, it becomes a habit. That's what you need at to what point, at what point do we realize 
We are sinning. Oh my God, great. At uh, what uh, point? <laughs> you know, you are sinned from the beginning. But as it. But know, hold on one second. If some people think that when they do something, it's okay, they don't think it's a sin. To them, is the norm. So again, if we sin by thought, word, and deed, and we do it, we do it time after time, day after day. There's no other sin. sin. Sin don't spell S I N for me and S I double N for somebody else. Sin is sin. So that's my thing. Because some people don't realize that when they do things that's not right, it's a sin. So that's what I'm saying. At what point? But what is sin for you may not sin for me. And especially the culture. Your culture may say, to me, it is wrong to, to have six and seven words. But in another culture, it is not a sin. So <laughs> that's where you have to beg God for a discerning spirit. That's at Damn. what point? At what point? Where where does where does it come in to say that you have sin? If you're going to talk about um, culture, if you're going to bring in culture, that's a very good example because mm -hmm. everybody's culture is totally different. So to to us, certain things might be sin, but to them, others that's the culture. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. At what point? Uh, when you are exposed, all right. I guess you are exposed to it. Exposed, you get somebody like to advise you, and, and you are exposed. You see it, uh, then you then you could come to the conclusion where this is sinful. All right, sin, sin. All right, let's hear Keith before I speak. Yes, no. Man was conceived in sin. Man was not as born a woman. Is born into a sinful world. Man is carnal. And so it almost seems like second nature for man to sin. Because even without thought, you, you, you sin even, even without thought. And indeed, the, you know they say you sin by word, thought, and deed. But salvation, salvation calls for discipline. It calls for effort. It has to be a deliberate act. Yes. It, yes, whenever, whether we sin or move towards salvation, it's deliberate. True. But because sin seems so pleasurable and that man is carnal, Anytime he has to move away from what seems to be his natural nature, it takes him a greater effort. And salvation, though desirable, takes a disciplined person and, an, and it calls for effort for you to change, to do that which is right. Okay, before Winston speaks, sin, sin is fundamentally our refusal or failure to do God's will um, either by disobedience or by omission um, so once we have and what is God's will what is God's will God's will is that we live in peace and harmony with one another. Um, so when there is conflict, um, that's where the sin comes in. So once we are not doing God's will, and so you try, we, we in our context, in, in whatever form we live, because Gloria mentioned about the um, polygamy, polygamous life, and we, in the Western world, we know about the monogamous life. So in the monogamous life, um, 
we know of one man, one woman. In the, the other faiths that practice polygamy, um, they know of one husband with many wives. And it's also biblical because we know of David with all his wives and concubines. We know of Solomon likewise. Um, so everything is relative. You must understand, though, now with the in, in terms of polygamy, the wives know each other and everybody's treated the same way. In the monogamous most relationships, that is not the case. Even in the monogamous relationship, re relationships, people want to have polygamous lives. Um, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Okay? So um, as long as you go against the, God's will, God's plan, that is where the sin comes in. Now, the question is, do we choose our sin? And most of us agree that we choose the sin. And because we choose the sin, the question is what prevents us from choosing salvation? Now, Paul began this text, chapter six, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And, and that is the human aspect of us speaking up there. God loves to forgive, sir. God loves to forgive. Why don't we, um, why don't we, why are we stopping him from forgiving? We can continue in sin, sin, sin. Do whatever it is we want and God will forgive us. That is the attitude that some people have. Um, but he says, no, a resounding no to that. And then he goes on to say that who we were is now nailed to the cross. When we speak about, and this is really, really um, hard now, when we speak about our, our self being buried with Christ, trying to new, live the new life, um, I do not know that we who have accepted Christ as Savior can actually say, that we choose our sin. You know that sometimes before you could even think you have um, fallen short, before you can actually get yourself together, you have lost it. You know that. And then you, when you sit down now, you realize, oh my God. Would you say that you chose that sin? Those are questions. Vincent, let's hear you. On mute. Oh, sorry. I suppose when I was looking at the question, I guess I was looking at it from this perspective in that if you say that sin is bad or evil, um, to say that we choose to sin seems to me to be saying that we deliberately set out to sin. And we are as, I guess we have free will and we can choose to sin or to choose not to sin. There are times to me when you may sin, but the sin is not deliberate. I remember some years ago, during a, probably maybe a similar length in discussion, we were having this topic about sin. And the director at the time, he gave us an example of and if I may use my brother Keith, and my sister here as well, and you, Reverend Irma, as an example. Now imagine that Keith, this was if the this imagine that Keith has a gun in his hand during this Bible discussion. Keith is mad, and Keith is looking for Reverend Arbors to shoot her. But 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 Keith, <laughs> Keith is looking for Reverend Arbors to shoot her. But Keith comes up on Hazel, and Keith asks Hazel if she knows where Reverend Ambrose is. And Hazel knows where Reverend Ambrose is, yes. But she sees the gun in Keith's hand, and she suspects that Keith, with the look on his face and the anger and everything, is that he's going to do something wrong. So 
Kesa deliberately lies and says, no, she does not know where Reverend Ambrose is. The lie is the sin, but by the same token, because he is, is mindful of the damage that Keith is likely to do to Reverend Ambrose, she, she sins or she lies. But in lying, she may have saved Reverend Ambrose's life. She tells Keith, no, she doesn't know where the Reverend is. Keith probably goes home. He calms down. Uh, whatever anger he was feeling now, he, he, he's no longer so inclined. Now, was he also wrong in sinning when she deliberately lied? <laughs> to my mind, I, I guess it, it it is not a, a, a yes or no answer, but to my mind, we should be practicing, I guess, maybe uh, what I would probably call mindfulness, where, where maybe we need to be mindful of each other and the effect that our actions is going to have on another person. Like, I guess, like in Paul's writing, Paul, to my mind, is, is, has a toss off, I guess, between law and grace, in that Paul seemed to me to be saying that where you transgress the law, you have sin. But remember that God's grace is there for you. So uh, in other words, you should not go on transgressing the law in order that God's grace may be forgiven for you and what have you. But you have to, or we have to recognize that um, because we have free will, we have to constantly think upon God's grace, which is God's salvation for us. And every time to me, if I'm inclined to sin, I should stop and think about like, how is this going to affect somebody? How is it going to affect me? Um, like for instance, like if it is me with a gun and they're going to shoot somebody, I should think now, oh Lord, how is this going to affect my children? How is it going to affect my parents? How is this going to affect my good friends at church? And that type of thing. So that's how you would look at the question really, or how I would be inclined to answer it. Thank you. Yes, Keith. Oh, I think Ron's uh, a, a, very, a very interesting scenario. And, and I'm going to use that same scenario. Now, given the scenario you just gave, huh? when I approach Hazel asking for Reverend Ambrose, Hazel made a decision. And that is what God has given all of us, free will. She did not have to say she didn't know. She could have asked you what you wanted it for. But she chose not to. So it comes down to choice. It, and her choice, we just make bad choices. And that's human nature. We make bad choices. And that is what has happened here. She, yes, the lie is the sin. And with all good intentions, she sinned. But you know what they say about good intentions? So the road <laughs> to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, so, so, go ahead. So it, 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 whenever you come down, it is you always, and that, that, that's, the thing, that's the beautiful thing of God. Because of his love for us, he never tries to prevent us when exercising that which he has given us, free will. He never does. He said, you will serve me, you will love me, but come on your own free will. That's God. So, but carnal as we are, we like shortcuts. Because it is always easiest. It is always easy to do something that is wrong. Because it, it is as if man is, is carnal. And he seems to be so, so conditioned, unless there's something else that's coming in to change him, he will continue to be carnal. And so he makes those bad decisions. So yes, we deliberately choose the wrong thing. And it is our choice, and that choice is ours. When we choose to sin, we choose sin. So. Okay. So, Ray, yeah, go ahead. What, is, go ahead. what is happening 
um, the war now that is um, going on now. Who's mm -hmm. saying? Who's saying? Who has said? Yeah. <laughs> What, who you who you think is the greatest sinner? Well, they're all sin. It can be no greater than it's lesser. You okay. protect my country, I can retaliate. I am sin. I have sin. If you retaliate, if you try yeah, to protect yourself, you oh, okay. Oh, Gloria, now you've done it. Now you've done it. Before you go there, let me just say that Genesis chapter 12, I was looking for it. Remember the whole thing about intentional lies. Abraham and Abram and Sarah. You remember that story? Yeah. Uh huh. Right. So when the Egyptians came to see Abram, he said to them that that's his sister. He says Sarah's his sister. In well, in some respects. Mm -hmm she was his sister because apparently they had the same, they had different fathers. But um, the point is they were married, their husband and wife. But he said that's his sister and he did that to protect her from them. So I'm, I'm saying all of that to say that there are times, there's times that we choose to sin and there are other times that we, that sin, it happens before you can even think about it. Oh, um, the, the situation now with R R Russia and U R Ukraine, yes. before Ukraine could even understand what is happening, they are in the whole, they're caught up in this whole thing of, of sinning, of killing each other. Yeah. And, and so you would, you, you would have to say that Russia chose to sin, and now Ukraine has got caught up in it. That's you know, so so that's something unforeseen, unpredictable. But at the same time, you have yeah. to, you you are self defense. So that's self defense, and and that is why the whole world has changed so drastically. Murder is no longer murder. It's first degree murder, second degree murder, third degree homicide, water homicide, vehicular manslaughter. manslaughter, all sorts of things we have going on. And it, it's not black and white. But I want to go on the side where we um, recognize that sin regardless of what it is and where it is, once we go against God's will, that is sin. And even though we are not always able to stand up, because if somebody has come to attack me, if I get first chance, let me tell them gone. You did about my, uh, oh, yeah, I agree too. first chance is, is self-defense. I, I didn't know about you know, if we in an argument, yes, and somebody wants to slap my cheek, I might turn the other one. But if somebody just come on me suddenly, listen, for a chance, they're gone. Because I'm not even, I, I don't even have to think about that. That, ain't even, I, that, ain't even, that does not even compute in my brain, in my brain cells. And, and that is basically who we are. As human beings, without the spirit realm, um, we are going to be preserving of self. That is human nature. Jesus, however, when he came, he came fully knowing what he had to do. Take on this frail human nature, live this experience, die this horrible death. He chose to die this horrible death so that we could have this grace, this grace that abounds more and more. But he's, he's come so that we, we, do, we, we realize that we do not have to walk that way. So we, we, we do not have to sin. We can choose to do otherwise because of this whole thing of freedom of choice. There's sometimes you can 
you can. And this is what we should do. But unfortunately, not everybody does it. And because not everybody does it, that is where this whole thing all fall down comes in. If we say that we choose to, as, as Christians, if we say that we choose to sin, then I, I'm, I'm sorry, but God, Jesus has died in vain. I want to say that we have chosen to follow the way of Christ. And because we have chosen to follow the way of Christ, we walk diligently. But sometimes, before even knowing, we fall back into the rut. Because sometimes, sometimes sin is easy. But I also want to say that living the good life, caring for people is so much easier too. Because there's so much joy in doing service. There's so much joy in ensuring that others are taken care of. There's a lot of joy in salvation. There's a lot of joy in living the good life, which is the Christian life. There's a lot of joy in that. But at the same time, so, so here's all that game that you say um, takes away your time. It only takes away your time when it's excessive. Other than that, it's fine. When we eat food, it's good, but it only becomes a sin when we eat everything in sight and leave yeah, yeah. nothing for anybody. So it's they're good things, and, and we we keep forgetting that sometimes the things that cause us to sin are really the good things. You care for your family, and because you're caring for your family now. You're working in order to provide for your family, you work two jobs. So you work in two jobs, you work in 24, seven days a week, including Sunday. Um, what is there? What What's happened there? You have sinned. You are sinning because you have not given any special time to be with your God. You have you have not kept, you know, you, you have not tried to, to take care of yourself, you are neglecting your body, all of that. But we do it in the name of taking care of the family, in, in the name of providing for the family and so on and so forth. We do all these things. There are some good things that we do that end up being sins. And those are the temptations. You see the temptation that Jesus had? There's nothing wrong with eating food. Especially when you're hungry and hungry for 40 days. Sometimes people can't even stand hungry for 40 minutes. Mm. And, and, and he was he, he would have been right to go and choose to turn the stones into bread because he had the power to do it. So sin is not always the negative. Sin is so much positive. There's so much help that goes on. You know, they say do not go, come to the hospital. Um, because you may infect persons who are already challenged. But you say, oh, well, I need to go and pray. I'm going to pray for these people. And I need to be present to pray. So you, you disregard the laws, the health laws or whatever it is, and you go on to see you praying. To what end? So it's not, it's not black and white. But I would want to say that as Christians... Um, we do not choose sin. As Christians, we need to choose Christ all the time, salvation. If perchance we fall down, that is when we have to look back and say, Lord, help me up. How did I get here? Please forgive me for what I have done. And you keep walking the straight and narrow because things happen so quickly. How many times have you not helped somebody? who've asked you for something, you know that you had it, and you look at them and you thought, oh, well, they don't need that. They're going to waste it. Is it, is it, is it, um, should you be the one to decide if they're going to waste it or not? They've asked you, scripture says, knock and it shall, uh, seek and you shall find not and the door shall be opened unto you. Um, but you've left them to go hunt somewhere else because 
you they look suspect. Maybe what what is that? That's would Jesus have turned them away? All of these things. So if we choose to sin, then I'm afraid that Jesus has died in vain. I want to say that as Christians, we sit close to God and we desperately ask him to guide us. And that is why we pray every day. And that is why we come to confession. And that is why we acknowledge that we sin in thought, word, and deed. And we ask God for strength to persevere. That's where the salvation so we need to choose salvation. If we have not chosen to remember that we have been near to the cross, then something is wrong with our Christianity. And that is why many of us are just um, filling the pews rather than um, exemplifying the faith that we have been called to. Um, Keith, is your hand up again? Let's go. And then Gloria. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It is again. My hands are not. <laughs> yeah, but you, you are on muted. You, you are on muted. So that's why I thought uh, you wanted to speak. But yeah. keep going. No, no, yeah, I do. Uh, I mean Gloria. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, but yes, I agree. As Christians, as persons baptized in Christ, we should we should choose salvation and we ought not to choose sin. But the, the thing about sin, if you look at it carefully, whenever people sin, at the root of it is selfishness. When it's always selfishness. And that is why as Christians, we ought to guard against that. As, as, as you said, we ought to guard against that. But even although it's a bad scenario with, with the wars, even because you remember, Christ, God did defend nations against a, another nation. So they so have let's, holy let's, wars. Let's, let's, yeah, let's holy very wars. be careful with wars. Let's very be careful with this war talk. <laughs> but the thing is that. And, and Keith, let me stop you there. That is the that is the impression of the nation of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. But if you are, as you said, if you are believers in Christ and we are buried to sin to baptism, then we ought to be choosing salvation. But salvation is having made that choice. You just it doesn't happen like that. It's a process, and you have to work at it. And as you say, just as we can easily say, well, you, you see, we don't even know it. You can't get salvation without knowing it. It's effort, and that is why effort. it's often so much easier to sin than to go towards salvation. However, the Christian should always remember, always remember that he is seeking salvation through grace, not on his own, but that to Jesus Christ, he who is interceding for him, he must be aware that when he chooses sin, he's going against God's will. And he's crucifying Jesus all over again. And yes, we, that's the weakness of the, the, the physical being. So but, selfishness. Yes. One is that selfishness is, is one of the things that causes us to not choose salvation. Exactly. Exactly. And being in this, this human um, tent, being in this tent and, and, and trying to live on our own, trying to do things on our own, causes us not to choose salvation. If we remember every day that Christ died for our sins, by his stripes we are healed, we will have a different perspective on life. And I think that's the bottom line. But we don't always remember. We don't always remember 
Jesus then on the cross. And sometimes for people now born in this era, they they find it difficult to they find it difficult to even relate to this Jesus who died on the cross for us. They even find some find it difficult to believe in the God that is a creator of the universe. Because they want a sign. They want to see. Just like Thomas wanted to see, and just like the other disciples had the privilege to see, they want to see for themselves that Jesus is was raised from the dead and that he was actually, that he's actually God's son. So um, weak faith or no faith is something that prevents us from choosing salvation. But if we decide to choose salvation and salvation is believing that Christ died for our sins and that we are being buried with him, and when we are buried with him, we will rise with him. Um, if we believe that, then my friends in Christ, we will be living the way God wants us to live in peace and harmony. We will be living a life that is dependent on God. It says, with Christ, I can do all things. That's right. Right. So it is how we are conditioned so that the Christian the, 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 the Christian has to condition himself through reading the scriptures and praying and practicing it so that he would always be in the right line, in the right mode, that when confronted with decisions, he makes the correct one. That is the, that of salvation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, because you see the assumption is, and, and, and Paul found those, this in the attitudes of the people that he addressed, what then shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Um, here's a read your message Bible. You still have it picked up? Yeah. Read, read, read that first verse. Read to verse four. All right, let's give me one sec. <laughs> uh, Romans 6, right? Just yes. Just give me one sec. Okay, one to four? Yes, please. Okay. So what do we do? Keep on sinning so God can keep on forgiving? I right, stop right there. No. Stop right there. You see? Should we keep on, should we keep choosing sin? Right, so that God that's, will keep that's on it. Forgiving. Should we keep, keep that's it. Forgiving. Should we keep choosing sin? Mm -hmm. so it says no all right go ahead okay i should hope not if we've left the country where sin is sovereign how can we still live in our old house there right stop there again you see that if we believe that jesus died for our sins mm -hmm. Why we keep, how can we keep going back there? How can we keep choosing to do what is wrong? Right. How can we ch keep choosing not to speak to our neighbor? How can we choose not to continue to, ha to, to help? How can we choose not to be forgiven? How can we choose not to be patient? True. I think that, that, is, that is fun. That is what it is. Continue. Okay. Or didn't you realize we packed up and left there for good? That is what happened in baptism. When we went under the water, we left the old country of sin, of sin behind. When we came up out of the water, we entered into the new country of grace, a new life in a new land. All right. Now, some people would say that you have to actually now go physically in the water and go under the sea to get that for that to happen to you and that's where some people want to have the literal immersion that's the death the death you have been buried since you've been buried um since if you haven't been buried then you can't be living this new life but it is not in the water the water is the symbol the whole thing is, is the faith that has to be believed. You have to believe in your mind that this is so. 
that you have died with Christ. So it's no longer you who live, but Christ lives within you. And if Christ lives within you, then you do what pleases God. And of course, you know that I know it is so easy to say. It is so easy for me to sit and pontificate. It is very difficult to accomplish and accomplish on your own. You have to keep talking about this Jesus and this God. You have to keep believing that what he did had real purpose and had real life. The washing away of sin, being born into this new life. If we are into this new life, then this new life says that we follow the commandments. And the commandments teach two things. You love the Lord your God for your heart, your mind, your soul, your body. And you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Once love lives on everything cool. Keith, you're talking to us? Yes. I know that in the spirit of sin, we can talk to the Lord. I'm not hearing you, Keith. Boy, can you hear me? We have no Can you hear me now? Yes, please. Stay right there in that position and speak. <laughs> So it has to be a case of a term that we don't like to use, brainwashing. But brainwashing, I mean conditioning the mind. The mind must be conditioned so that the mind is always fixed on Christ. And uh, whatever we have confronted by decisions, because we are born baptized and we are fixed on Christ, then Christ will always be the answer for us. Yes, please. All right. So the second question. Sin separates us from God. How are we restored to the risen Christ? <clears throat> How can we share the promise of new life with others who are struggling with sin? <clears throat> that was part of the scenario. How to share the promise of new life with others who are struggling with sin. So the statement is that sin separates us from God. <clears throat> How are we restored by the risen Christ? I was just going to say Christ is the answer. That, and that, is, that basically sums it up. We, he died so that we might live. And we have to keep on holding on to his hem, have, having to try and try even though we, we will fail and we will fail miserably but we try we have to try to live a life that is pleasing to him and we do that by loving each other and and following those two commandments that he gave us because they take care of it all so just just by relying on his grace and knowing that he did it so that we could have life he paid the price. He paid the ultimate price for us. And in so doing, we have this great chance to spend eternity with him. So he knows that we, he paid for our sins before we even sinned. Mm. Right? So the, the price is paid and the gift is there. It's grace. So it's up to us to accept it. Because the they says he will knock but he's not going to force himself on us. So we have to make that choice. Yes, please. Be Christ-like. That's uh, simple. Yes, be, be Christ-like. Christ -like. Correct. <clears throat> and the big one, the big one, how can we share the promise of new life with others who are struggling with sin? Mm. I think that is the main question. I say, that, go ahead. I say that is the main question because our world is our world, our Barbados is um, um not cool. I was listening to calling program today. Ma was so upset and he was so angry. He was actually arguing with himself. And I'm like, what's wrong with this man? He was talking about the political parties, and I don't even know what he was saying, but he was really, really angry. And he doesn't care about this party or the next party, and he wants governance, and you know, I don't know, like, 
What's that all about? We are angry. <laughs> we are a set of angry people. I don't know if you don't know that. Yes. And anger yes. is a sin to be angry, to let the sun go down. Your anger, it, you know. Um, yeah, I guess when you when you let the sun go down on your anger, that's where the sin comes in. You can get angry, you can get upset because there are feelings, and feelings are just there. But if they lead you now into other things, that's where the problem comes in. And so and so that's so important when we talk about you sin in thought, word, and deed. Felicia Sue, I haven't heard you yet, so let's hear you, darling. Evening, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dear. My answer to that would be simply by living the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5, 22. Simple. Sim I'll read it for us, the, for the benefit of all of us, online and in Zoom. Sure. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version, the mm -hmm. fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if we live by the fruit of the Spirit, we can share the promise of new life with others because we will show it in our life as an example. Bottom line, and that, especially that one about self-control, because if we were able to exercise self-control, the prisons will be empty. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, my dear. Keith, your hand is it's, up or you um, need to take it down? Oh. All right, it, it, it's, it's up and down. Listen. <laughs> The, and as the lady just said when from the reading, the best way for you to impress any person about anything is to share with them your experiences. Speak of what it is that you have experienced in this about this new life. Share them, testify to your experiences with them. And uh, when they see you, you, you live it. But you're not only just living it, but you're sharing with them your experiences. And when they see you, they see, see, see how they love. And then you can testify of the great things and, and the joy that you receive. Then people, people are always interested in hearing other person's experiences in, in some in some event and to me this is there's no better way than to testify and share your your experiences with it and live it out yeah to practice what we preach all right yes because jesus offers us the new life and here's all um i think i think um uh, St. Francis of Assisi said it best, right? When he said, preach the gospel always, use words if necessary. And you, so yeah. it's by our lives. If we, it, you know, if we live the lives that we're supposed to live, we would be Christ to others. And they would see Christ in us. Yes, so important. It is critical that we live the life that is how others are going to be able to, to share the new promise. That's how they're going to get the new promise of life if we, if we live it out, if we practice it. Um, and the practice makes the perfect. So we definitely, all of us, have to make a concerted effort to live what we believe preach the gospel by the lives we live and when necessary, use words. Live out the gospel, when necessary, use words. Yes. Um, our closing remarks, Keith? No, I, I, you're, <laughs> I looked away and I don't know if your hand came down. I'm sorry. I'm to sorry, keep but I, I, keep, I, keep, I keep forgetting to take it down. Okay, no problem, no problem. You know, but, um, the baptized life, 
because we have been baptized into Christ's death and his resurrection, we are welcome into the Lord's family. When we are welcome into the Lord's family, that is where we learn to care for each other. And that is where we learn to help each other. And that is where we learn to entertain strangers um, and foreigners and welcome them into the Lord's um, house. And this is what he would have wanted. Initially, we had to start somewhere. And so he began with the nation of Israel. But having begun with the nation of Israel, we know that there is going to be a new Jerusalem. And God, the whole world is not Israel. John 3.16 3, tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the whole world, the whole world, because he died for the whole world, then we are obligated. We who have chosen to follow him are obligated to share the new life with others. And once we live that out, um, they will come around. Yes, Felicia? Just wanted to share an experience which I had last night as you were summing up that when we live this life, um, once we practice it, um, we will be an example to others. But how would you respond to this? And it's always a paradoxical situation. Now, last night, I went to St. Philip's Parish Church. They were having a mission service as part of the Petronas Festival. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the service, I think it's probably as the last hymn was announced, this person came into the church, um, a guy who seemed um, not to be in the best. On set of Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. And, well, he beckoned to the priest and the priest went down to him. Um, so then I think eventually he left. Now, afterwards, we were told that he said he was either running from the police or to the police, the police wanted him or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking about that scenario where you're saying how we treat people because I came away saying normally these people when they are in difficulty they always find the church for some mm -hmm. reason you know I mean of all the places he they go they come to church so are we supposed to turn him away you know so you are here speaking about you know how we should live but there's that part that so what do we do do we so, because if we welcome that person, it could have been trouble, you know? So it's just mm -hmm. your thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it is, it is hard. Those kinds of decisions. But if you notice, not if you notice, you will recall that the that the, the synagogue in biblical days, it didn't matter what you did. As long as you ran to the church, that was your place of refuge. And the church, the, the synagogue would not have turned you away. That is why um, priests still, still have to be of that mind so that they hear confessions. And if they say that they um, have done something you cannot go and report them to say that they did whatever. You will probably converse with them and get them to go with you or convince them to go turn themselves in, but you are not supposed to turn them away or turn them in. But that my question, Rev, is mm -hmm. what if it poses a danger to yourself? Um, no, if it turns, if it, if it's a danger now to yourself, um, I would now have to say, God has saved me from my sins and not from my senses. <laughs> um, so that is why it's important 
for the way that we travel. And when I say travel, the journey we are on as Christians, that your intellect must be part of your, um, be, be part of all your activity. Scripture, tradition, and your reasoning. And God will lead and guide you. And he will not want us to put ourselves exposed to danger or harm. He wouldn't. So we just do that. Let me comment on this here. I would like to comment on this. Yes, please. You know, uh, I've had a, an interesting experience one evening conducting prayer group. Mm -hmm. We were in the process of praying, and a young man came into the church. You're probably hearing this for the first time now. I've never really spoken of it. And uh, he came in, and he he want he's hungry. He he wanted something to buy something to eat, but he was disrupting. So I raised my hand and told him to wait, to wait. To sit in pew and wait, sat for a few minutes, and we continue praying. And this guy got up and started to carry on with a tirade, and he had some big rocks, and he's gonna lick us up. I said, "Wait!" And I get up now because I am, to be honest with you, I have bare ladies around me. I want yes. to <laughs> <laughs> So I anyhow. I confronted him. I said, you wanted us to help you. And this is how you expect to carry on for us to help you. You are interrupting a prayer group. And uh, he back off his tone that he can, he can fire him. But I went to him and made sure he didn't have space to throw the stones. I confronted him right up to him and said, give me the stone. Give them to me, and uh, he gave it to me. He gave me that big stone, and I put it down. Asked him to take a seat, and then we will address him when we are finished. So I said, "So done." But I tell you the truth, I'm glad that he gave me the stone, cause I had to take it from him. He would not have been around. That's the truth. Because things like that anger me, and you don't want to see me angry. I don't know. I, I so I just simply confronted him and asked him for his turn. And to be honest, with you, I frightened. That frightens me about myself. Where you get frightened, I tend to get angry. No, that's very dangerous because you can end up hurting yourself. Right? But that is how I seem to be made up. I just confront him. I said, oh, you give me that stone. And if he wasn't, hadn't moved and given to me, I know where I was, he couldn't throw it. I would take it away and he didn't let him how he take it from me. Mm. But I'm, the card was in the midst of it all. And he handed it over. I took it, put it one side and put it on. After the service, you address his concern. And yeah, um, you know, it, it, the, those who are in trouble always know how to find a church in their time of trouble or need. And that should say something to us as Christians, because nobody sends them there, you know. Nobody sends them there. They're, they're, they come because in their psyche, in their, in their mind of minds, whatever that is, they know that God is the creator of them all. They know that. And, and that is why as Christians, we, that, that's why we keep saying, or people keep saying, as Christians, we are vulnerable. And sometimes people will take advantage of us. But you don't just lay down and play dead sometimes. You have to, that's why you reason, you, you have to do reason. reason. And, and, and then you repeat that. Yeah. God has saved us from our sins, not our senses. Yes, and he so, didn't give us so a, 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 a spirit of fear either. And he did not give us a spirit of fear. Yes, yeah, sometimes you will be shaking in your boots. 
and, and people come to the church asking for money. They do not realize that we have understood that people try to take what we have and so we don't walk with money anymore. People don't walk about with money. And that's because we got saints. So nine times out of 10, out of 10, when somebody asks us for money, we don't have money, we got plastic, but we don't have cash. And, and that is a reality these days because we realize that people harm you when you have money, but they still come. And when they come now, they want to treat it like a raffle, right? When they come to church, they want to treat you like the raffle. So they come to, to Winston and you get $2 from him, then they're going to Hazel and get 5 and then come to Deidre and get 10 and come to Keith now and get five, and all this in the same morning, you know, and if one, if, if they get out of Sylvia, she said no, they say, see you, I, I come to the church, but they add up, I, I at the back now, we, I counting all these people that he get money from. So when he get out to me and said, all right, sir, you've had enough. He said, but you ain't give me nothing. He does not realize that all of us are one. He or she, they don't realize that all of us are one. But that is just how they operate. And that is why we must always be praying people. And if we think that we have faltered in any way, do not stay down. Ask, ask God for forgiveness and guidance, and he will bring us back on track. So everything in context, every situation is always different, Felicia. Every situation is always different. So sometimes we might want to help. Sometimes we can't help. Sometimes we have to turn away. That is our reality. But the church is definitely the hospital for sinners. None of us are perfect, but we are all striving and thank God for his grace and his mercy that has brought us through. Nothing of our own doing. And so each day we have to pray so that we will walk the straight and narrow way and live out the fruits of the spirit. Because listen, God does see and know. God sees and knows all things. Okay? I hope that has been helpful. So my friends, having been baptized, having been welcomed into the family of Christ, we are called to live the resurrected life. We are called to note that our old self has been nailed to the cross. And because the old self has been nailed to the cross, then we live in the spirit. We live in newness of life where we pattern ourselves each day or try to each day have the mind of Christ in that though he was the son of God, did not count it equality, but humbled himself and became obedient, even death on a cross. That obedience is what we need to fall into line with. Okay. That brings us now to the end of our session and our session of the study of baptism. So next week, we are going to have a new series. There are two I'm thinking of. I'm not even having even come down on one, but we will meet next Sunday. And I believe it's going to be the Acts the latter part of the Acts of the Apostles. I think that's what we will be doing next week. So you will get that sooner than later. Okay, let us bow our heads to pray. Loving God, our Father, maker of heaven and earth, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, we have been born again into new life adopted for your own and received into the fellowship of your church. Grant that we may grow in the faith into which we have been baptized, that we may profess it for ourselves as we grow in Christ, and that all things belonging to the spirit may live and grow in us. Lord, as we seek for all things to grow in us, Remember those among us who are sick. We pray for 
Aquinda, Aquinda's mom at this time, she's not feeling well right here in Barbados. So I pray, Lord, that you strengthen her in her weakness. Lord, that you give the children the calmness of spirit as they minister to her. And we pray for healing, Lord, and comfort and sustainment even at this time. Remember all those who are in hospital and those who are gravely ill. Lord, be with them as you promise. Even though they walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you have promised to be with them. And so, Lord, we bring them by name and nature. You know them. And so we pray that you will continue to minister to their needs. We continue to pray for all those in health care and the healing ministry. Lord, that you will continue to give them vision, new insight. You will strengthen them as they interact with your sick servants. And we pray, God, because you are our healing and resurrected Lord, that your gracious will may be done in all of our lives. This weekend, we celebrate Mother's Day. And so we pray for all mothers in the land and across the world, that they may acclaim their femininity, that they may display and be proud of their motherhood and their ability to, to, to bear children and to raise or to raise children. We pray, Lord, that they will continue the nurturing process of children so that they can come to the fullness that you have prepared for us. And Lord, help us always to be sustained by your word. So blessed Lord, you cause all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which you have given us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. All right, my friends, if you can, let's see your face. And then we say good night and have an awesome weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. And Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And Hazel, Hazel, is your better half? Hazel, when you see me with a gun coming towards you asking for the priest, you know what to do. <laughs> I will lie. I will lie. I will lie. <laughs> <laughs> Think about something else. Anyway, good night, everyone. I have another meeting, so I have to go. All right. All right. Bye, 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 Good night, everyone. Good night, Gloria. All right. All right, Hazel. Bye-bye. 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 B